own. I can lean upon his arms and be lifted up from harm. If I stumble or if I'm thrown, I'm alone, yet not alone. When my steps are lost and desperate for a guide, I can feel his touch, a soothing presence by my side. By my side, he is bound me with his love. Watchful angels straight from above, every evil can be brave. For I know I will be safe, never frightened on my own. I'm alone, yet not alone. I'm alone, yet not alone. Praise the Lord. I like that. I like that. I think the Lord uses that. Amen. So praise the Lord. He moved on that. I don't know if you didn't know he was moving, then you better go find a new moving company. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's why I like him singing it, man. And if something started moving me, man, I'm going, I want to hear it again. That's the way it is. Have you ever listened to a song? You know, you have a tape or CD and, or you know, iPod and stuff. And, and nowadays, I mean, who knows what a CD is anymore. But... <laughs> But you want to play this one song that really moves you over and over. You play it again, you play it again, you play it again, you know. That's what I like. So uh, that's why I said play, sing that song again. That's a great song. So, uh, you know, that song was sung by a Christian woman. And um, Hollywood made a mistake. They wanted to give her an award for it. And when they made the decision to do that, all of a sudden everybody come out of the woodwork blasting Hollywood for wanting to give an award. They backed out and didn't give her the award for it, the song. So, you know, they used to do that. Even though they, it was a, a religious song, you know, a Christian song, they, they would actually, if it was a song that touched their heart or you moved them, they would, would, they would give an award for it. I mean, uh, um, Ron Hamilton got one for one of his songs he wrote. And, uh, but they, they backed down and said, we're not giving it to you. So, that's a, cause it's, it's a great song. And so it just reminds you, you know, we have to stand alone sometimes. I mean, you're alone, but you're not alone. Lord's always there. So, you may feel like you're alone. What's that? Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. Always there, amen. Well, let's go ahead and dismiss our children to uh, their class. And uh, we'll open our Bibles. We might as well start at the beginning here where uh, where uh, the beginning of the message, not the beginning of the book. <laughs> but we are going to the book of Leviticus. You know, we, I remember when I first got saved, uh, uh, we, my wife and I had two cats. We just got two new cats. And one of the cats we named Leviticus. <laughs> and the other one was uh, Deuteronomy, right? Ecclesiastes, that's right. Ecclesiastes and Leviticus. And uh, I told my preacher, we, hey, we got two cats. We named them Leviticus and Ecclesiastes. And he looked at me like, really? <laughs> I said, hey, hey, I'd rather name them. I, <laughs> I didn't know. It. I didn't understand either one of them. And the thing is, though, I like the names. <laughs> so, well, uh, yeah, so I never forgot that. And uh, yeah, that was funny. That, uh, I was just saved. I thought I just liked, I liked the name of the books. So, hey. I don't think it. I don't think it offended God. <laughs> so hey, I think he's saying, hey, he likes my book so much, he's going to name his animals after. <laughs> Had Adam naming animals. You know where'd he get? It was funny because if you read about him naming the animals, God said he named the animals, and God accepted it. You know that that's what it is. Why? Because because Adam said it is. But Adam was perfect then too. Amen. Didn't without sin. So. Uh, he didn't have he didn't have the things we have today that interfere with us, interfere with our righteousness. Amen. And uh, well, we we'll look at Leviticus, Leviticus, uh, chapter twenty-four. When you find it, stand, and we'll read two verses out of there. 
It says, verse 15, and thou, by the way, this isn't preached on too often. I was, I was putting this together. Lord gave me this to me at 4 o'clock in the morning one day. I mean, he gave me the whole outline. I mean, he gave me the verses. Uh, <laughs> I woke up at the bed at 4 o'clock, and he says, here's what I want you to teach on, uh, well, teach or preach, whatever ends up happening on Wednesday. And uh, he gave it all to me right then. And I'm sitting there going, man, God, no one preaches on this ever anymore. Verse, verse, what did it say, 15? Verse 15. It says, and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, whosoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, is, is, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him. As well the stranger as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, Shall he put, shall be put to death? Now that was the law back in those days. They don't do it today. If they did, America would be destined for people. Amen? Because they blaspheme God all the time. And in fact, in the New Testament, God says, you can blaspheme me, you can blaspheme my son, but you don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Huh? And I'll, t I'll tell you what that all means in a minute. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you help us. Give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding through this, Lord. I pray that you help us, Lord. Maybe we'll get to have some conviction about how we talk about our God. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. You can be seated. I am, I'll tell you what I'm sick of, social media. You say, why? Because they use OMG so often, and it, all it is is a, a blaspheme of, the, of God. That's all it is. And, and Christians don't get it. I'll even say to Christians, you know that I was, when I first got saved, you would have never said anything like that as a believer. In fact, if you were, the preacher corrected you. Huh? And I learned early about idionyms. Okay, you know what idionyms are? Something that's similar to, to the, for instance, uh, people, uh, people will use words for cuss words. Now, they're not the cuss word itself, but it means the same thing. And they do the same thing with God's name. They'll use idioms, and you, it means the same thing. But it's not, it's not said, it doesn't say God's name, but the, the meaning is the same. So that's what God's talking about. God's not stupid whether you're doing that or not. You know, he knows what, he's keeping account of what you're doing. He knows if you're blaspheming his name. Christians are blaspheming God's name even today. No wonder we don't fear God. No wonder churches are erect and ruined. Because God's not going to be in the midst of all that mess. Huh? To say the things. Oh, let me give you a tell you, let me give you the definition of blasphemy. An act of cursing or slandering or reviling or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God. What did you just say, Brother Mike? Okay, using God's name in a cursed manner. How about slandering his character? I'll give you an illustration. God's all love, he doesn't judge. That's slandering his character. Because he is a judge still. You're saying what, God forgot about judging? God doesn't judge anymore? His character changed from the Old Testament to the New? He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is going to judge. Why do you think he has a judgment seat of Christ in the great white throne judgment? He's going to judge his earth in the tribulation. He is still a judge. He is loving too. See, what we do, we get out of balance. And what? And a false balance is an abomination unto God. And we, so we blaspheme. Christians are blaspheming God's name. Blaspheming his character. Blaspheming who he is. They paint pictures of what God is and he isn't. Reviling him or showing contempt. Like rolling their eyes back. <laughs> this message again. Huh? Huh? I have to listen to this again. He's taking too long. <laughs> huh? About attacking God through the preacher and the preaching? And we blaspheme God and we're looking at our watches? Hmm? All this stuff. I'm <laughs> like, and God, God's laying all this on me. I'm like, he's going like, nobody has any kind of reverence for God anymore, it seems like. Now, God didn't say that to me. I just feel that way anymore. It's just like even talking to preachers, and I, and I hate to put it this way, but preachers, they have little reverence for God anymore. Hmm? They, 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 look at it. That's one thing I like about the Jews. 
Like where the God's name don't come off their mouth because they have such reverence for His name. Huh? Oh, they may not be. The, they may not be saved. They may not be uh, a, a child of God. They may not. They may not even know who God is. But see, it's been inbred in them that this is a God of holiness. And I'm not saying every Jew is that way. And you get these Orthodox Jews, man. You don't. You don't speak uh, God's name unless you have a purpose in it. See, well, Christians would would do good if they would have the same way. Hmm. Where when you say God, it had a purpose and maybe you were talking to God or you're bringing out the doctrines of the Lord. Hmm? You talk about Jesus Christ in a right, right manner and the Holy Ghost in a right manner. I've never met anybody that I know of that's used God, the Holy Ghost's name in a cursed manner. As in the fact of you saying the Holy Ghost in, I could say use Jesus or God's name. I've never met anyone, but I know they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Because just blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, it's just giving credit to Satan for what God's done. <laughs> huh? I'd be careful who I gave credit to. Huh? So right here, here, God, God blaspheming God was a serious crime punishable by death. That's just as important to God then, he's telling us in Leviticus. That this is so important that you use his name correctly and you reverence him correctly and you don't revile him or slander him or curse him. Because he had a punishment of death. Well, what other crime or what other sin do you know that God put men to death for? He makes you curse in his name equal to that. Murder? Kidnapping? Adultery? Fornication? Sodomy? And we'll go and we'll rail on the sodomite, we'll, we'll laugh at them, we'll, we'll, we'll preach to them, and yet with our own lips later we'll curse God. Yeah. Yet he said, it's punishable by death. Maybe you die spiritually. I know we're not under this law. I know this was to the Jews. I know that. But it seems pretty serious to God. And if we take it serious, if God takes it serious, we should take it serious. But two, you know what? I'm telling you, I believe in, I believe in the rightly dividing the Word of God. But I think we've, hyper we've got this hyper-dispensationalist, uh, rightly dividing, almost a Calvinistic kind of religion now, where we don't believe what God said in the Old Testament. We don't believe, look at the Ten Commandments are poo-pooed by us. Hmm? Because we're not under the law. And I understand that. But you know what? There are laws you live by still anyway. Because look, at you're not supposed to kill. You're not supposed to commit adultery. You're not supposed to covet. Hey, you're not supposed to, to lie. Hey, you're not supposed to be that murderer. You're supposed to have only one God. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. God hasn't changed any of those things just because we got saved by grace. Though, look, at, I'm not keeping the law, those laws to be saved. I'm keeping those laws to do right. Because when I got saved, God showed me right. Just like you. And you started reading the Bible and all of a sudden you got into conviction because you were doing wrong and you saw what God said was right. And you changed your way. Hmm? If you turn over to Exodus chapter 20, I know you know all this already. Because, uh, you know, everybody is smarter than me because I, I can agree with that. Amen. <laughs> I find myself to be very dumb at times. But look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You know, God used a mule, so he used Brother Mike. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. This is the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Huh. That's a third commandment. You know the first two commandments are talking about the Lord too. Him personally. First three commandments. Before he comes to the Sabbath. And then he comes to honoring the mother and father. What is he doing? He's hitting, the, he's hitting uh, authority. In order. Hmm? Amen. So you got the third commandment here. You required that the name and reputation of the Lord be upheld and be upheld by his people. 
Look at, if someone, look at, I don't even know how many times that someone has used, a Christian used God's name in vain, and I've said, hey, God's not for that. That is not right. A Christian shouldn't be saying that. When I was lost, I said that. And by the way, when I was lost and I said those things, I felt bad after I said them. I really did. In fact, my wife didn't like it when I, she was, she never used them. But when I, when I used them, she did not like me using them. And we were lost. And we were druggies. <laughs> we were drunks. And yet she said, no. In fact, before we even got saved, she had the Ten Commandments hanging on the wall. She was trying to get me into conviction then. <laughs> huh? And I'm sitting there reading them, and I actually read them. I remember reading them. No, that's the only Bible I read. <laughs> and I read the Ten Commandments. She had that hanging on the wall. And I'm looking and I'm going, really, really, really? I'm like, I'm feeling guilty. <laughs> I really did. And I remember the one, talk, the third commandment here. I remember that. And uh, no wonder my wife would say, don't be used in Jesus' name in vain. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> what, what do you want me to use? <laughs> huh? Hey, Amen. But it's not right. And Christians are doing it today. Christians don't control their language. It's sad. Man, I don't even know how many I've talked. I've heard. It don't take long either. All you have to do is bring up doctrine. And if they don't agree with it or they don't know their Bible, it's going to allude to that. To that language. And I said, they're going, it's not where I want it to go. I'm just trying to teach you and help you. It's all I, I tell them. I said, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to help you. But they don't want the help. But let me show you some things here. I got four points I think I got. I think it's four points. Yeah, it's four points. They may be long. They may be short. Who knows what they'll be. Turn over to Matthew chapter three, chapter 9. Let me show you something here. Now, we just mentioned that that blaspheming God's name, blaspheming, be, be, be accused of blasphemy by God, is punishable by death. Look at chapter 9 and verse 3 of Matthew. It says this, And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man is a blasphemer. This man, I'm sorry, this man blasphemeth. Who are they talking about? Jesus Christ. And so it says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Now, what did he just say to them? They're calling him a blasphemer. He knows, they're not saying it with their lips. He knows what they're thinking. And he says, he tells them that this is evil in your hearts. For whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, rise, take up thy bed, and go unto thy house. And he arose and departed to the house. So here he was, Jesus Christ was accused a blasphemy. Was he wrong? Was Jesus wrong? No, because he was, he, he was tempted as we were, but without sin. He was pure. He was perfect. I was reading today, he had, he had a perfect spirit. He had pure words. Huh? I'm sitting there going, look at that. He said he has pure words, and God wants us to get back to the pure words of God's word and pure words of what Christ spoke. But people are pushing us away from Christ. These false teachers. You, you, you follow Paul now instead of Jesus Christ. Huh? No, I follow Jesus Christ, and if Paul's following Christ, I follow Paul. Peter follows Christ, I follow him. Hey, if uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, if they follow Jesus Christ, I follow them. But if they left him, then I follow Jesus Christ. Even if he's called a blasphemer, because he's not. But these false religious men were calling Jesus a blasphemer. Look over Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Why are you bringing this up? Because I want you to see some things here. By the way, you could end up being called a blasphemer. But if you're there, they're wrong in their assumptions and wrong in their evaluation of you, then you're in good company with Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 20, 26. It says this. Let me see in verse 63. 
But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Now they, they asked him a question. You tell us whether you're the Christ or not. You either say, yes, I'm the Christ, or no, I'm not the Christ. Okay, he didn't, they didn't give him a maybe. They gave him, a, they gave him two choices. You tell us whether you're the Christ or not. Now look at this. The Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus saith unto them, him, him, thou hast said. What's he saying when he said that? You said it whether I am or not. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power, coming in the clouds of the heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying he had, look, you're trying to look spiritual. Rent his clothes, saying he has spoken blasphemy. See that? What further need have we of witness? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy, it says. Go on. What think ye? They answered and said, he is guilty of death. Why? Because that's what the law said. If you commit blasphemy, you're to die. Huh? Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Mocking him. Okay, what they're doing is they're saying, they, 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 they said that he needs to be put to death because of his blasphemous tongue. By the way, that's interesting to me that they said they have no law to put Christ to death. But if he's truly blasphemous, according to the law, they had the right to put him to death, according to God's law. But here, they, they wanted to take him to the Romans and you put him to death. They, they wanted to turn back and say, you deal with him. They went back and forth on this. But here they accuse Christ of blasphemy. Hmm? What, what's that? That's like one of the most horrible things that a Jew could be charged with. Huh? So we turn over to Hebrews chapter 4 just to help you out to see whether he did blaspheme or not. In the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. What does he say in verse 15? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but it was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He's, he's perfect. He didn't blaspheme, but yet they said he was a blasphemer. You say, what? Because he was perfect. He didn't do wrong because he is God in the flesh. 100% man, 100% God. He was the Lamb of God. He's a propitiation for our sins. He's our, he's our advocate. He's our go-between. He's our bridge between man and God. Look in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Now I want you to remember this. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and sal unto salvation. You see that word, without sin? He wasn't a blasphemer. If he did, why did they say that he's without sin? And why did they say he'll be without sin when he, and, and unto salvation? Why did they say that? Because he was sinless. He didn't blaspheme his God. He didn't blaspheme his Father. Can you imagine God blaspheming himself? <laughs> hmm? By the way, let me ask you a question. You ever blaspheme yourself? No, you usually don't say bad things about yourself. <laughs> In fact, you might lift yourself up a little farther than you should. Hmm? No, he, didn't, he didn't blaspheme himself. He didn't blaspheme his Father in heaven. He didn't, he, he didn't break the law. He didn't break the law. Hmm? Now look at this. T turn over to 2 Samuel, chapter 12. I mentioned this uh, Sunday, just briefly skimmed across it. But look at 2 Samuel, chapter 12. In verse 14, remember, now this, let me lay this out. Nathan came to Jesus or David and uh, confronted him about his sin of killing Uriah and, and committing adultery with Bathsheba getting her pregnant she has a little baby in her in her in her womb she has a little boy uh, Nathan comes to confront him because God told him to gave him what to say found out that David was guilty David had uh, pronounced judgment upon himself before Nathan said you are the man 
He said, that man shall die and pay back fourfold. And he goes, you're the man, David. And David realized his sin. He confessed that he sinned against God. Uh, verse 14 says, How be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to what? Blaspheme. You gave him a, you gave him a reason to destroy the character of God, to curse him. You know, I, I started thinking about this. Remember when Moses was with God? And God wanted to kill all the people of Israel and start over with Moses. What did Moses say? Oh, don't do that because the, the people will think that you brought them out into the wilderness to slay them. You know what God, You know what Moses was pleading with God to do? Don't blaspheme your name. Don't, don't revile yourself. Don't curse yourself. God, you know how people are going to think? You're going to give them occasion to blaspheme you. I never thought about that until I was studying this. And all of a sudden, God says, look at that. That's why I gave Moses the right of way. Hmm? He, made, he made perfect sense. Hmm? But here, David gave reason for the enemies to blaspheme God. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Huh? That's the product of his sin, that little child. Was, was it really a punishment to the little child? Not really, because that child went to be with the Lord. And David even mentions that. The child shall not come back to me, but I shall go to the Lord, or go to him. Basically, he'll be, he'll be with him in heaven. He'll be with him in the Lord. Huh? But because of sin, he brought on blasphemy to, the, to, to God. Let me ask you a question. When, when, is, when does your sin bring blasphemy to God? The things you do. And then you go and profess you're a Christian. And people, <laughs> you're a, look, what you're doing is exactly the same thing my sister done, or my brother done, or my dad did, or my mom did. And they, they were there, the wickedest person I ever met. My friend, the wickedest person I ever met. You're doing the same thing, and you profess to be a Christian. What kind of God do you have? What did they just do? They brought blasphemy to God. They destroyed his Look, what kind of God you got if he's not strong enough to keep you out of sin? You understand? We, we, are, we are doing things to God I don't think we project in our own minds and hearts. We understand in our own minds and hearts that what we're doing to God. What we're, what we're putting out there in this old world, they laugh at us. They laugh at the church and the preachers, the, ch the Christians. Pre preachers used to be revered. Preachers used to be feared. I remember when I was a kid, I remember preachers coming over to our house. Hey, Amen. I, I, I'm seriously, as a kid, I didn't know anything about Christianity. I didn't know anything about the church. I didn't know nothing about the preachers. You know what? But when that preacher came into our house, I had like a reverence for him. A lost kid. I, I treat him with ho holy respect. Hmm? I have a friend who says that when he was a kid, he said you could go past his church and go into his church any time of night and the doors would be unlocked. You go in there, you can read the Bible, you can sit in there and pray, you can kneel at the altar and pray. He said it opened 24 hours a day. He said then they found a guy defecating on the Bible that was at the, at the, at the altar up here and he said they had to start locking the doors. Because why? Because everybody lost the respect to the church and reverence to the church and God and the man of God and the people of God. Something's changed. Maybe we're giving them that taste in their mouth and the flavor of disrespect as believers in Jesus Christ because we give them a reason to blaspheme with preachers who commit adultery and fornicate from the pulpit in their offices. And all we do is bring blaspheme to the God in his name. I can't name on two hands the preachers I know that did all those things. And it hurts me. I can't imagine how God feels. You know who else blaspheme? Let's look over here in Romans chapter 2. Paul points it out. Romans 2.24 says this. 
for the name of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles through you, as it is written. He's telling the Jews, the Gentiles. God is blaspheming through the Gentiles because of you. <laughs> I thought the Jews were supposed to be holy. I thought they were supposed to be the people of God. I still believe that they're going to return to him. I believe that God is working in the midst of Israel. I think it's all going to come to pass because God says so. But here's the thing. Is Paul in, the, in this whole situation says the Gentiles blaspheme your God because of you. The people of God. I wonder how much more the church today is bringing blasphemy to God by the lost world. So to say, quote unquote, the Gentiles. Look over in Acts chapter 18, 6. I'm going to tell you, Paul, Paul, feel, I feel like Paul at this point right here. I'm not joking. I mean, when I read this, I said, man, that's exactly how I feel a lot of times. <laughs> Look at this, Acts 18, 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Huh? They wouldn't listen. They blasphemed. They blasphemed, it says. Not only were they bringing blaspheme to God because of the way they were living and things they were doing, but they were blaspheming themselves. And Paul just shook all his clothes. Hey, man, it's time to go, man. Get out of here. I'm going to the Gentiles. Huh? So I'm out of here. Sometimes that's how I feel. I want to just take my coat off, shake all the stuff off it. Hopefully I don't take anything with me. I'll go to somebody else. Huh? I'm tired of hearing it. <laughs> huh? When does God get respect? When does he get reverenced? When does his name not be blasphemed anymore amongst the believers? I can't stand it anymore. I'm telling you, I, I, I feel, feel with Paul right there. Huh? You know what? And it wasn't a lack of love Paul had for the Jews. He loved the Jews. He loved them. He was willing to give up his own salvation for them. Uh, he was like, you know what? I'd give up what I got for them to come to Christ. they get saved. Wouldn't it be great if Israel would come back to God? Hmm? He was willing to take punishment for him. That is Christ-like. Let me turn over first Timothy, our fourth point. Christians can blaspheme. Oh no, Christians can't. Oh, oh well, let's see. First Timothy in chapter six, verse one. Let as many servants as are under the yoke. What is he talking about? Is he talking about salvation? What? Is he talking about salvation? Count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, why, why would he be so concerned about lost people taking care of the master so that the doctrine of God be not blasphemed if they're not saved and they don't even, they don't even claim the name of Christ? He's talking to people who claim the name of Christ, who claim the name of salvation. And he says, take care of your master. You want to know what the problem is with the unions? If, there, if I was a Christian, I'm in a union. I'm not going to be in a union or I'm not going to pick it or not doing nothing. By the way, I was in union. Ask my wife. I walked out. They said, you got two weeks to make a decision. I said, call this my two weeks notice then. To the whole thing, they had a whole big meeting. And it was all about me and the things I had to do as a union worker. I wouldn't concede to them. What, did you walk out? I did walk out. See, I don't preach this stuff because I'm just guessing. I'm a Christian. We do things different as Christians. We don't do it the union way. I don't pick it against my boss. He's the one who's paying my bills. I made an agreement to get this much money an hour with him. 
If he wants to give me a raise, praise the Lord. If he doesn't give me a raise, praise the Lord. I'm still going to work for him. I need the money. I've got to pay my bills. I'm not going to sit on a picket line like Boeing does around Christmas time when these guys are making, uh, you know, $2,000 a week, and yet and then at Christmas time they picket for four weeks, and they get $100 a week by the union. Wow! That's not even a drop in the bucket for what they need. How can they justify that? That's because they're the world. Well, guess what? I'm not going to give them reason to blaspheme God and his doctrine. Huh? No. It, look at when I passed up in Washington, everybody was union, weren't they, in our church? <laughs> I used to preach this stuff, man. They looked at me like, what? Oh, man. They, <laughs> they just laugh. <laughs> you get, hey, you know what? Some of them were, they were changing. I said, you guys, you guys, you guys dress up better for the unions in your work than you do for church. I said, you wear a suit to work. You come to church in a tank top and a pair of shorts. I said, who are you respecting? Who do you revere more? I said, I have reverence for God. Look, when I'm at home, when I go to work, you're going to see me maybe in a T-shirt or a button-up shirt and blue jeans and a tennis shoes for work. When I come to church, I wear a tie, I wear a shirt, I wear pants, I wear a suit. Because right, I'm coming before the Lord. People say, well, I don't have to do all that to come as you are. You know when he says come as you are, they take that out of context. That's talking about when you're lost. Come as you are. You know what? They forget that they got saved. <laughs> they just keep coming as they are. It's really different. Hmm? He's, willing to accept. He's not going to reject anybody who comes unto him, no matter what their condition is. They're going to be a harlot, a pro, uh, you know, a, a pimp, he could be, could be a druggie, he could be a drunk, huh? just maybe a businessman. Come as you are. If the Lord's speaking to you, come on. You get saved. Hmm? Now that you got saved, let's be different. <laughs> Why? Because you're now you're in the presence of a God that is worthy of all your reverence and respect. Don't blaspheme him. You're blaspheming when you're lost. Don't blaspheme when you're saved. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 5, you back up to chapter, verse 14. It says this, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear, marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion. By the way, did you notice that guide the house? <laughs> you want to know why? Husband's not always there to guide the house. He's at work. Unless nowadays generation, he's at home being a house husband. <laughs> guide the house, give none occasion to the... By the way, I have, to, I have to stop there for a second. There was a guy who said, God hasn't called me to work. I said, which God? <laughs> I said, you don't work, you don't eat. Bottom line. Hey, if you have to go get a McDonald's job to flip burgers, do it. If you can't get a job anywhere out, hopefully you can get a better job than that. But hey, I wouldn't sit at home waiting for the... the I get a phone call from some company that wants to hire you on for $30 an hour. <laughs> By the way, you almost make that at McDonald's now. <laughs> Minimum wage has gone up. <laughs> Another story. <laughs> it says this, but it says, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Hmm. Huh? Don't give occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. What does that mean? That uh, blasphemy. Now look it. This is what the, the women are supposed to be doing. Child left to himself, bring his mother to shame. You give occasion, you give occasion to this old world to blaspheme God because you got out of line. Now I'm telling you something. People homeschool their kids. And they don't do it right. And they'll say, see, they homeschooled and it failed. It don't work. God's wrong again. No, you can't train your own kids. What does the Bible say? Train up, the, train up your child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. But see, we don't do that. 
We'll say we're going to homeschool, but we don't train them up in the way you should go. Or we don't homeschool, we send them over to public uh, perversion schools. I don't call them public, they're government schools. They're not been the public for a long time. They're government schools, perverted schools. They're teaching neutral gender, gun, sh gun play going on all the time in a no-gun zone. Now they want to put armored rooms in the classroom where in 30 seconds everybody could be in there, close the door, and they have cameras inside. You can watch everything that's going on, all the air conditioning, all the ventilation, so that if they shoot at you, it won't penetrate the walls. Why don't they just put a gun in a, in a holster on the teacher's side? Why don't they do like they do in Israel and put an AK-47 on their side? And the teachers, I, I saw the picture of this. On a lady teacher, she was in shorts right down to here. She's wearing a tank top carrying AK-47 in the classroom. <laughs> the gun was bigger than the lady. She was about 4 foot 11. Thing almost drug to the ground, but she got that gun. Israel's only had two classroom shootings in 40-some years since they did that. We think putting all our kids in a bulletproof room is going to stop someone from coming into the school to shoot it up. We are dumb, dumb, dumb. No, you're a good guy with a gun is going to stop a bad guy with a gun. Bottom line, that's all there is to it. But what are you saying? I look at it. I said all that, but I'm not putting my kid in that school. And I'm not gonna have my wife put the kids in the school there. No way. And we train them up. We don't give them occasion to blaspheme God either through it. That means you're gonna have to be diligent. You're gonna actually have to put some effort into it. Some of us have very little effort sometimes. <laughs> Titus chapter two. Do Christians blaspheme? They have, they have been known to blaspheme God or give occasion to blaspheme God. Titus chapter 2, verse 5. To be discreet, oh, let's back up a little bit. Um, the aged woman, verse 3, likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Look at that. Not false accusers. Whoa. False accuser? Well, I'm looking for a, an aged woman where I can find one that's not a false accuser of somebody. Did you, did you just hear me? He's one of the busiest buddies of the aged women. What are they teaching the younger women? Behavior has become with holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Not, well, you know, that's, by the way, that's one of the things Christians are saying, oh, we can drink wine, Jesus drank wine. I look at it, I do it in, I don't do it in excess. I can, blah, 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 whatever. They forget the Bible when it says, uh, wine's a mocker, strong drink is raging, who serves deceived thereby is not wise. So you're a fool if you're going to drink. That's the bottom line. You say, How, why do you say that? Because I was a drunkard and that's what God taught me. Hey, fool, get away from that. <laughs> Hmm? That the, by the way, you notice I use the word drunkard? <laughs> Not an alcoholic. Man, I cringe when people say alcoholic. I'm like New Age Movement. You love the New Age Movement, don't you? That's why you call them an alcoholic. I don't call them an alcoholic. I call them a drunkard. That they may teach the young women to be sober. Whoa. To love their husband. By the way, Charlie Andrews said this. You want to know why God said that? Because young women don't know how to love their husbands. They have to be taught to love their husbands. To love their children. Boy, they have to learn to love their children? No, 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 I'm not writing this. He's telling the aged women to teach the young woman to do this. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Boy, that's a novel idea in today's society. Good and obedient to their own husband. There's another novel thing. He's got a list of things that the wife's supposed to do for one purpose. I'm coming to the end on it. That the word of God be not blasphemed. So if you're, ladies, if you don't follow that with your husband, then you bring an occasion for the word of God to be blasphemed. The whole world's going to say, look at that. Another Christian family broken up. I thought they had a God that could keep the family together. You know the divorce rate amongst Christians now is at 60%. Are you kidding me? We're equal to the world now. 
It used to be, you know what? In the late 1800s, you know what the divorce rate was amongst Christians? 1%. Now it's sixty percent. Hundred years later, what's happened? It's the way we live. If you're going to bring blasphemy into your home against God and His Word, why should He be present? Why should He be present? Oh, God's in our home. We got little signs on the wall, but you don't follow them. <laughs> you don't be obedient to your husband. Your husband's the man of the house. He's the husband. He's the God put in position there. Look at I didn't ask for the position. Hmm? God gave it to me. I didn't ask to be pastor. But God gave me that too. Hmm? <laughs> Amen. What did he say? Young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In verse 6, and verse 7, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Whoa. Don't give him a reason to condemn it. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. That means the, the guy who's not living for God will be ashamed that he's not living for God. How does he get ashamed? By how you living for God. Don't let them talk you out of it either. How many times have you lived for God and someone made fun of you because you're living for God? Or they, or they mocked you because you're living for God and shamed you out of it. That happens. Peer pressure. <laughs> Verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. See, your whole life is all about God and His Word and not bringing blasphemy, blasphemy to His Word, but bringing an adornment. I mean, where it looks beautiful in the eyes of men, where they desire to know what the Word of God has. They desire that, that Savior. They desire to know God. Look at our lives aren't supposed to be where we drive people away, but we're drawing people to God. Amen. So what did Jesus do? Shame and reproach came to him. Huh? He took all this to the cross. The Bible says that despising the shame in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. He took the shame to the cross. You say, why are you bringing all this up? You know, when people say that in Hebrews 6, it says they, uh, come, they, they basically, they're trying, I'm going to paraphrase, they, they want to say they have to get saved again, and they put Jesus Christ to another open shame. Well, he's already been shamed at the cross. He's taken it to the cross. It's been, been put under the blood. And they think they can go back and do it again, and again, and again, and again. No. It's only it's once and for all. What is shame? It's a painful sensation excited by consciousness of guilt. Did you hear me? A painful sensation excited by a consciousness of guilt or having done something which inj injures reputation or by the that which nature or modesty prompts us to conceal. So basically, you, you can destroy the reputation of God and call it what we call blasphemy. Huh? And you should be shamed because of it. People say, well, don't make them feel guilty. Why not if that's the way they're living? They should feel guilty, especially if they're saved. <laughs> if you're saved, don't live that way. That's wrong. That's against Scripture. I had one guy, I tried to tell him, I tried to tell him, man, you're not right. This isn't right how you're living. Well, I haven't left God. Yeah, you have. <laughs> you left God a long time ago. You think you're with God still? You remind me of the guys at the mission. Oh, I'm in the gutter smoking dope with God. He's not in the gutter smoking dope with you. He's on the outside of the gutter asking you to come out. He's not going to be drugged through the gutter. Look, don't put him to a shame. You should be shamed. What's a reproach to upbraid to suggest blame for anything? A man's conscience will reproach him for a criminal, mean, or or unworthy action. Your conscience will bother you. You've been reproached. 
but you committed a crime spiritually, maybe even physically. What? God's taken that shame and reproach to the cross. I'm going to say, I'm going to re read you something that the Lord gave me to write. We need to learn. By the way, he not only had me write this, but he actually allowed me to feel what he felt. That's why I wrote it. We need to, by the way, that's when he woke me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep. I told my wife I couldn't sleep. No, he, he made me feel the shame and reproach. Deep in my heart. So bad I didn't want to eat. I know why he didn't want to eat. Didn't want nothing to drink. Huh? He didn't want anything to do. All he wanted to do was talk to God. Hmm? It was such a grievous thing. Shame and reproaches. I kind of wonder how many of us actually feel that when we sin against God. We need to learn how to feel the shame and reproach in our heart and conscience when we sin against God. Pride sneaks in and robs us of his humility. You know what happens? As I, he was allowing me to feel that shame and reproach, all of a sudden, I'm not joking, just a, just a little inkling came in of, well, this don't pertain to me. <laughs> you know what happened? All of a sudden, I'm not joking. As soon as I said that, that shame and reproach disappeared. That means, that means conviction was gone. That means opportunity to repent was gone. You know what entered in? Pride. That don't pertain to me. Well, really? That's what God said. Really? Have you sinned against me before? Have you sinned against me this week? Have you caused some kind of issue? Something maybe you don't remember? Should you not feel shame and reproach? I know it's taken to the cross. I know he died for all our sins and they've all been taken to the cross. But when we commit sin as a believer, when we, when we bring the reputation of God down to men's level, we should feel shame and reproach. That that's me that did that. And fall on our faces. When do we cry for our own sin? David committed sin against God. You read in Psalms 51. And he, you, you feel his broken heart and the shame and reproach that he penned in Psalms 51. And you see how grieved he was. When are we going to be that way? When is God, God going to get a per person that's going to be humbled, totally humbled before him, saying, Lord, that's me? We sing that song. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. What do you stand in need of prayer for? I need money, I need a car, I need a job. <laughs> or is it, Lord, I've sinned against you and I need some mercy, I need some grace, Lord. And I've done some horrible things against you. This old flesh keeps getting in my way. This old world keeps speaking in my ear. This old devil keeps putting things in my eyes. And I keep, every once in a while, I look at it. I think about it. I touch it. Hmm. Lord, it's me. It's not my neighbor. Hmm? It's not my wife. It's not my kids. It's me. I'm the wrongdoer. Hmm? Shame and reproach should be on my conscience when I do wrong. I always, that's why I tell you about when I was young, women who had children out of wedlock, it was a shame. Men and women who lived together without being married was a shame. Using drugs was a shame. Drinking in public was a shame. Huh? Cursing was a shame. You didn't hear cursing in public? People didn't curse. You didn't go to church? It was a shame. Now the shame that men should be bearing on their heart and soul for their wrongdoing to a God that they blaspheme now isn't there. I'll go to church when I feel late. I don't have to go to church every Sunday. I'll just be a Sunday morning church goer. Hmm. I don't have to tell anybody about Jesus. Really? 
I don't have to hand out tracks. Hmm? You say you're saved and you got the light of God in you and you're excited and you're full of joy, but yet you don't spread it to anybody. <laughs> I remember when I got that, and I'll finish with this illustration. I got that uh, Thunderbird for my wife. It had the turbo engine in it, a turbo, in the, and uh, it was a nice car. I, I used to say it was like a stock car. That's what it was. It sat low to the ground, and uh, it was fast. It was a beautiful car. Beautiful car. You know what I did? I took that around to people and I said, hey, look at this car we got. And everybody wanted to drive it. Everybody wanted to ride in it. You know, I remember my preacher took my preacher and goes, can I drive it? Can I drive it? And he drove it. He wanted to open it up and hit the turbo. And he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to see how fast this thing go and how fast it would go. Huh? And he did all that. You know what? I didn't hide the fact I had that car. It was a beautiful car. My wife didn't hide the fact that her husband got this for her birthday. She told many people, look what my husband got for my birthday. Huh? But how can we do that with Christ? And we say we have joy and love and peace and, huh, in our hearts. And we don't want to spread it to anybody. We don't want to reveal it to anybody. We don't want to show it to anybody. Maybe it's because we blaspheme God so much in the presence of others that we don't want to offend ourselves because of what we've done. What are people going to think about us now if we start talking about God? <laughs> hmm? It's too bad. I was, in home, I was in Walmart. I said I was going to end with that illustration, but I was in Walmart. Was it yesterday? That lady that tried to take all my groceries and take them back? I bought all these groceries. Had a cartload of stuff. So I'm paying for it. I'm handing the money to the cashier. This lady comes up. She's like a front-end cashier, head of the cashier or something. She comes up and takes my cart and starts taking it back to the back of the... I called her, hey, wait, 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 where are you going with my stuff? She goes, oh, did you buy this? I thought it was stuff that had to go back on the shelves. <laughs> you go back here. So we, we broke out a conversation. Now, I, now she knows me, my wife, all our kids. I mean, my wife goes in, she says, where's your husband? And I go in there, she says, where's your wife? Where's your kids? Blah, blah, blah. So I talked to her. You know what? I don't talk to her and try to pretend I'm not someone I am, uh, I'm that I'm someone I'm not. I let her know I'm a preacher. She goes, I said, we were talking about little Jacob. And uh, she goes, I said, if you have an inkling to pray, pray for my son. She goes, preacher, I will pray for it. Wait, what did she just say? Was it the prayer that impressed me? No. She knew I was a preacher. She didn't say, hey, want to be preacher? <laughs> Fake preacher? Huh? Because I didn't give her a reason to think that way. know how you're living. Our Heavenly Father, help us understand what we heard. God, I pray you get glory out of all this. Exalt your Son, Lord, because He's worthy. Lord, help us to be conscious of how we treat you in the presence of our enemies, in the, in the face of this old world. And I know Satan's going to do all he can to bring blasphemy to you. But let, us, let him not use us as a tool for that. God, teach us. Convict us in our heart. Let us really feel the shame and reproach that you, your son felt at the cross. I can't imagine all the sin put upon his shoulder. And all the shame that he felt. heaviness of heart heaviness of heart and soul God use this time for your glory and we're praying what about you the Bible tells us these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. For three things we notice here that was written to us that we can know and that we can believe. All before we leave this earth, we can know consciously in our hearts and in our minds that we are saved before we leave this earth. God has made a promise to us. He tells us there's none righteous, no, not one in Romans 3.10. 
Why aren't we righteous? 